At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. And I'm very pleased to say that today we have the latest and newest member of the Drug Science Scientific Committee, Professor Celia Morgan from Exeter University. Celia is a, a renowned psychologist and psychopharmacologist. She's a professor of psychopharmacology there in Exeter. And uh, I'm going to enjoy talking to you today. Welcome. Welcome, Celia. Thanks for having me, Dave. <laughs> so you've had a very interesting career in terms of psychology research because you've always targeted the difficult things to study, haven't you? You know, you've, you've worked with cannabis, you've worked with ketamine. Tell us a bit about your background and tell us why you became a psychologist and, and how you kind of got to this position of being probably the first professor of psychopharmacology in Exeter, I imagine. Yeah, yeah well, I think... It was down to another psychologist, professor of psychopharmacology, Val Curran, actually. I was an undergraduate at UCL studying psychology and Professor Val Curran, who was my mentor and is an amazingly um, generous and patient woman, and I accosted her outside the lecture asking her if I could do a project about ketamine. I'd noticed that people were taking ketamine in party settings instead of kind of the usual drug, which had, and this was in the late nineties and normally people have been taking MDMA at that time and people started taking ketamine. It was still quite niche. And I asked her if I could do a research project looking at the consequences of that. And then that kind of started off my career in this area, I think. Was that your PhD? Was your PhD on ketamine then, was it? Yeah, yeah. On the acute effects of ketamine with Val. And then looking in, in recreational users as well, because at that time... Well, that famous study when you gave it to her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did. We piloted it on Val for one of our studies. And she asked us to stop the infusion. <laughs> so, yeah, no, so we did it. We did a number of studies. I was interested in consciousness, I guess, um, in the essence of it and what the unique subjective effects of ketamine and how they might be related to kind of cognitive changes. That was what we were looking at. And then looking in recreational users, because... It was growing in popularity at that time when I was doing that research, it was still relatively niche, I think, mainly available in the gay scene and amongst spotters and at free parties, but I'm growing in popularity. And yeah, there was very little, well, no research about the kind of recreational effects, only a number of case studies. So that's, that's where we um, started. Yeah. And then went on to do a postdoc about ketamine, the recreational use of ketamine and looking at people who use it very heavily. So we're working with people who were largely addicted to ketamine and, and then work started to emerge about ketamine bladder as a result of that and yeah so that's where I've continued really. Well let's start with that why so what did you discover why did people take it in the first place? So we did a well, this is kind of a qualitative analysis we did some interviews with people about the reasons they were taking it and there were kind of three camps I think so there were people who were psychonauts, I guess, who were taking it to explore their own consciousness and taking it for the psychedelic effects. You know, and that's, we see those people nowadays quite prevalent and, and vocal. And then there were a group of people who were taking it in combination with other substances. So taking it as polydrug users, so taking it alongside things like MDMA. And then there were a group of people who were taking it really because at the time ketamine was very cheap and taking it for more classic escapism reasons because ketamine is very strong and yeah so those were the reasons we found why people take it essentially from that but yeah in terms of the addict people taking it very frequently and the kind of addictive profile i guess a lot of that's similar to why people take addictive drugs in general to sort of manage negative emotions and a kind of escaping from reality but i guess in ketamine for a group of users provides quite an intense way to do that because it literally does dissociate you from reality. And those dissociative effects are something I became interested in. I mean, I think that's where I started. I was interested in dissociation really in my PhD and I've kind of circled back to that now 
being interested in that as a kind of factor in the therapeutic effects of ketamine. Well, we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later on. But, but in terms of, I mean, dependence on ketamine is strongly associated with tolerance. Is, is that right? Yeah, and it's a drug that produces a really kind of rapidly developing tolerance for tachyphylaxis. Um, so, and people, um, even in the anaesthetic use, will require much higher doses. I think the dependence partly as well is to do with some of the psychological effects and maybe even the psychedelic effects. I guess the effects of ketamine wear off quite quickly. It's got a short duration of action compared to other psychedelic drugs, really only about an hour. It's got a short half-life. And people report kind of chasing the meaning, the insights from the ketamine experience in a way you don't really see with other psychedelics. So that's quite interesting. It's a bit more like cocaine where people go on a binge, a weekend binge, always trying to recapture the, the buzz of the previous one or the first one. Yeah, and I think we know that those kind of having a short duration of action of effects is associated with a more kind of binging profile, right? And more um, propensity for dependence. But yeah, it's quite, yeah, so that's, I think the tolerance is a factor in people becoming dependent on ketamine. And do you think there's withdrawal as well? I mean, I don't. do people have withdrawal syndromes if they stop? Yeah, I mean, we, we spoke to a lot of users and they seem to just describe a withdrawal syndrome. You know, not kind of physical withdrawals like you get with alcohol, but anxiety, sleeplessness, irritability. And then, yeah, I guess, I mean, the physical symptoms associated with ketamine use Things like ketamine bladder and something called K cramps that you describe, which are these really intense gastrointestinal pains that they get from taking ketamine. And then they take ketamine to manage the pain that comes when they don't take ketamine from these K cramps. So it becomes a really vicious cycle. And I don't think we really understand yet the origin of those. There's some evidence that they might be something to do with bile ducts and some kidney problems. But whilst we know quite a lot about ketamine bladder now, we really don't these K-cracks have been reported quite a lot and I think we don't really know where they come from. Well, I remember, I think when I first started, well, I, I, I still remember on, on the ACMD when the question was raised about, well, the concerns were raised, I think partly from UK data, partly from data from Hong Kong about the bladder problems and mm. the debate was going on, you know, how could we help do something about this? And in the end, we, we decided it, making it Class C might sort of help at least educate people into the fact that they were, this was a relatively is less harmless than people thought it was actually a potentially relatively harmful drug but we're not there's not much talk these days about the bladders anymore I and mean, is that because it's gone away or is it just that people have got bored and don't care about talking about it <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't think it's gone away no there's actually some interesting research um from jelly southgate someone at york who found that it's actually direct toxicity of ketamine on the bladder epithelial cells that are lining with the bladder and there's still people getting addicted to ketamine but yeah we don't hear about it as much now i'm not really sure why that is it's always been relatively niche and maybe it's something that people yeah was in the media spotlight for a while yeah i don't think and i think what happened <laughs> no offense dave because that's when you were <laughs> chair of the acmd but making it class c actually the use increased subsequent to that i mean it might have been on a trajectory of increasing now i was quite shocked i was talking to my undergraduate students and I think students are quite a good barometer of drug use <laughs> in the world and they were saying um that actually now ketamine and cocaine are the two most popular drugs exeter amongst <laughs> students so not MDMA normally it was always MDMA I mean obviously after cannabis but um of those recreational drugs so maybe they're an unusual sample but oh, ketamine certainly massively increased in popularity again that could be cost and actually I think you're a bit more certain you don't tend to get well, I think that you, when you get ketamine, you kind of n usually know what you're getting. You're not going to not like it to accidentally overdose, I guess, on ketamine, like people have been doing with these super strong MDMA pills. Do you think that's a factor? Yeah, possibly. I mean, it is, it's a safe drug in that it doesn't slow down your breathing or your aspiration. I mean, sadly, some people in our studies, certainly the very heavy ketamine users have died as a result not of their use per se, but accidents associated with their use. Yeah. There was one girl who's 19 who drowned, and that's really where I think ketamine is dangerous in overshooting the dose. So it was important to have someone who's not intoxicated with you to protect you from those sort of accidents. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's perceived as safer. Maybe it's to do with a change in the mood of people. I don't know. MDMA is a very outwardly social drug, and yeah, ketamine is much more. Well, characterized by its kind of dissociation and essentially separation from reality. Although we've done some work recently talking to people about their ketamine experiences, 
they do report that um, although dissociation, so they feel detached from reality and detached from their body, but they also feel more connected to the world around them. So it's certainly a really interesting profile of effects. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why it's become so much more popular recently. But yeah, maybe it's just cost. <laughs> it yeah, just cost be. Yeah, it does. yeah. But I think the, our paths first crossed when you, I discovered you were working on this this phenomenon of some kind of frontal damage from chronic ketamine use, which intrigued me because it seemed very interesting, odd, and and possibly um, a model for forms of dementia. Almost, we want to tell us about that work and you know, such a strange finding. You wouldn't expect that, would you? But you did. Yeah, we did some. So we did some imaging studies with ketamine users. So those people who use it really heavily, so we're taking it every day mm. in doses up to about. Some people are taking ten grams of ketamine a day, which is a phenomenal amount. And we found so looking at the white matter tracts in the brain, some damage in the kind of connectivity between brain regions um, in the frontal lobes, and then and this was kind of mirrored in some functional neuroimaging studies that we did, and also mapping onto cognitive deficits that we'd observed in ketamine users so where we found poor uh, executive function so that's your kind of planning abilities your higher level cognitive abilities i mean yeah i don't know if it's something specific about ketamine per se or more to do with the profile of being addicted to drugs in general so there's some commonalities that are seen there in frontal deficits in people who are addicted to other substances so but yeah yeah we were interested in i mean originally i was looking at ketamine kind of changed when we come to my recent work but as a model of psychosis that was the thinking at the time back in the late 90s and early 2000s so it's whether you know you could come up with a model of psychosis and certain symptoms of psychosis and the idea then you might be able to test drugs against this um, but it never was particularly a very good model of psychosis I think so yeah I think and, and, and a lot of the work with the imaging was looking maybe at the consequences of like a, a prolonged state of hyperglutamatergia really so having increased levels of glutamate at non in the major excitatory neurotransmitter not everyone understands it quite at the same level as you so maybe just could you sort of deconstruct that in simple words for those people who aren't experts oh <laughs> uh, yeah so ketamine so ketamine works mainly by blocking this receptor in the brain called the nmda receptor um so it acts as an antagonist at that receptor so that's a blocker and this is really, it's an important receptor in all sorts of functions, particularly in, in neuronal learning, so the ability to form memory traces in the brain. But actually ketamine's action, although it blocks this receptor, it seems, and, and the neurotransmitter that works with this receptor is a neurotransmitter called glutamate, and that's responsible for all the kind of excitatory transmission in the brain. <laughs> um, so that's, um, and what happens, what people have found is that ketamine blocks these specific type of receptors on a different, <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this in simple terms. I think maybe I've gone into a to uh, further much detail um, day, but uh, these other type of receptors, which are inhibited receptors, so they kind of put the brakes on the brain and they're called GABA receptors, and that ketamine preferentially blocks, <laughs> and I'm talking a lot of receptors here, these NMDA receptors on this other type of so uh, these other type of neurons, so these are GABA neurons, so these are the inhibitory neurons. So effectively, in a much more simple way than I'm explaining it, by take, giving someone ketamine in the brain, this takes sort of the breaks off these inhibitory neurons, and this increases this excitatory transmitter glutamate. I'm sure you would explain this better than me, Dave. <laughs> so perhaps I'll add over to you. Very complicated, but the, po I mean, the point is, and, the, and I think I spent... The interesting thing is that it's paradoxical. Ketamine, in many ways, is a very it is paradoxical. It's anesthetic, but people enjoy taking it. It gives you insights, but uh, even though it's blocking some facets of memory and encoding, you it actually you know you can you know still remember and experience the trip. So it, it is a, an unusual drug compared with most of the drugs we work with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I think paradoxical is a really good way of describing it, actually. Yeah, I don't know how we got to my terrible neuroscience explanation. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> We'll stick with paradoxical. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's paradoxical. It's because, because glutamate, there are so many, there are you know, multiple subtypes of glutamate receptors are on different neurons. I mean, it's a it's a circuit, you know, the circuit gets disrupted and it ends up being pro-glutamate rather than just glutamate, which is the paradox, yeah. 
But you, but you you were fascinated by you know, the cognitive dysfunctions. I mean, just, are they permanent? What do we know about them? Are they permanent? Are they, is there anything we can do about them? I mean, are people just right? Well, in the in the Captain users, they seem to be transient. So we were, we were looking at people who were taking really, as I said, high doses of it daily, and so but they seem to show these this pattern of cognitive deficits and some kind of unusual thinking and things like increased depression. Again, paradoxical to ketamine's new antidepressant properties. Um, but with, then we, we tested people who'd taken ketamine very regularly and given it up, and they, they seem to be, they seem to recover the cognitive function. So that, I guess, is positive for users. Well, that's reassuring. So it's not quite as bad as alcohol then? No, no the same is not true of the bladder problems. It seems like about a third of people who give up ketamine can um, reverse the bladder damage, and then a third it stays the same, but yeah, they, I think that it's different with the kind of, and that's what's interesting when you talk about alcohol is that the, the ketamine does have a physiological effect on the body. So it's really detrimental effects on the bladder. And so it's very few drugs that seem to have that profile, I think, with something so detrimental um, physically that, you know, some of the people in our studies, there was a girl, I always remember who's six, 16 years old and was going to the toilet every half an hour. So this is the kind of, someone who's taking and very frequently again to like five grams a day and then ultimately ended up having to have a cystoscopy so to have her bladder removed and the consequences of that you know wearing a clostomy bag and having it was just it's tragic really and so yeah it's certainly really profoundly problematic that but in terms of cognitive function that seemed to recover so yeah i guess that's positive well that's the other thing and then suddenly ketamine goes from being a, a drug we're all scared of and you know we we start to control because we want to try to prevent people dying from it unsuccessfully, as it turned out. And then suddenly you turn it on its head and it now becomes the, the revolutionary new treatment of uh, what, depression and now addiction. So let's start with depression. I mean, what, you, were, you were present through that kind of re-emergence, the, you know, this transformation of ketamine from evil to, to you know, zero to hero. Huh? How do you explain that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, as you well know, it's not the drugs that are addictive in themselves, right? It's circumstances around the individual. And I think it's something, you know, it's the reason why people take drugs. Clearly, they don't take them for the harms. They do have benefits. So even recreational users are tapping into the benefits of the substance. And yeah, just acknowledging that, yeah, everything is has a cost benefit. And ketamine's antidepressant effects. So it was something that you know, users would report mildly, so if we followed up more, I spent a little bit of time at Yale with John Crystal's group who, you know, were kind of the, some of the pioneers. I mean, obviously the work happens a lot. Some of the earlier work with the antidepressant properties of ketamine happened back in Iran, I think was one of the first studies, but yeah, so being around that group and the need for new um, mental health treatments being so dire and then seeing something that works so profoundly differently to have this rapid acting antidepressant effects. I mean, the work with addiction dates back a lot further potentially than the depression work. Well, yeah, we'll come to that in a minute, um, the Kropitsky and Co. Just, uh, am I right in thinking, I often teach that, um, that the Yale group were trying to use ketamine as they were using THC to sort of model psychosis. And then they noted that the volunteers often felt more cheerful the next day. And so that was an example of serendipity like so much of psychopharmacology serendipity is that the true story i don't know if that's the case but yeah that sounds, sounds like a reasonable estimate yeah because it certainly was being used as a model of psychosis when i was there and was you know different drugs were being given to offset the effects of ketamine so it's thinking at ketamine combined with lorazepam or haloperidol to see if you know the psychotic effects could be offset and it was found that haloperidol didn't reduce the psychedelic, as we call them now, or psychotomimetic, so psychosis mimicking effects. And then they found lamotrigine, so a glutamate inhibiting drug and prefrontal cortex, that did reduce some of the psychotomimetic symptoms. So, but yeah, I think, yeah, maybe serendipity definitely has a massive role <laughs> in psychopharmacology. It is psychopharmacology, like the story of applied serendipity, isn't it? Which is... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I ended up, I mean, I think, you know, I did some work on cannabis for a while and that was through an serendipitous event of just being, I was presenting a, paste, a poster in Chile at a conference and I was next to someone called Antonio Zawadi, who's from Brazil. Yeah. And he was 
my post was on ketamine at the time and we've been collecting hair samples from our ketamine users and his post was about this extract of cannabis reversing the effects of ketamine and i was like oh that sounds odd <laughs> and that was um cannabidiol and so we ended up looking at that in the hair of our ketamine users which is quite an unusual thing to do and found that there seems to be reduced psychotic symptoms so yeah that was another really serendipitous event that led to us conducting quite a lot of studies in the cannabis space so yeah well just actually on that point don't just don't just leave the listeners hanging what you discover was it can well this is such an important study that you discovered that can cannabidiol the presence of cannabidiol in the hair samples of cannabis users was associated with less reports of psychotic symptoms is that right yeah i mean what psychotic symptoms is probably a strong term for we were looking at subclinical psychotic symptoms so things like mild paranoia perceptual disturbances but yeah we've been looking at those scales and it was in you know just it was a big an, an opportunistic sample because these were ketamine users and then poly drug users there was across a sample of 150 drug users i think so yeah we looked at at the hair of um, these individuals and your hair is a bit like the rings of a tree it keeps a record of all the toxins you've ingested and we had levels of thc and, and cannabidiol so thc is the main active ingredient in cannabis as i'm sure your listeners know and then cannabidiol and we found that people who had only thc in their hair seemed to show higher levels of things like paranoia because people with thc and, and cbd had much lower levels so yeah, we thought that was interesting. We followed that up with some work. <laughs> well, it wasn't just you followed it up. I mean, the... well, no, mainly like that old Cohen, who was, yeah, so this was work when I was a postdoc and then we looked at the hair samples and, and yeah, that was Val's really pioneering work. I mean, shit, so I was a postdoc on those studies. Yeah, and Val was amazing. I mean, it's amazing, but um, she was amazing. One of the respects in which she's amazing persuaded the Home Office to allow us to collect samples of cannabis from people and analyze it for levels of, um, cannabinoids which is great so we went around people's homes and we looked at 600 individuals so it's a huge <laughs> an enormous i mean tell people more about it i don't think people people really understand just how <laughs> how much work we did in the real world of people using cannabis <laughs> no and that was i mean in my postdoc i've been cycling around squats <laughs> in north london testing people on ketamine and then we moved into cannabis and Val, I don't know where the number 600 came from. I'm sure it was a power calculation of some kind based on genetics, but that was the number in the grant. So we had to test 600 people. And I kind of ran a team of researchers, which was great, just going around people's homes. They would smoke cannabis and we'd run some cognitive tests on them. We took some DNA, some cheek swabs, and we took a sample of their, and we looked at the kind of symptoms they got. So things like well-being from cannabis, but also these the effects like paranoia what we call psychotic-like symptoms. Yeah, we took a sample of their cannabis and analyzed it and then related those acute symptoms to the different levels of THC and CBD in their cannabis. And then we came back and tested them seven days later when they weren't intoxicated. Um, yeah, that was a that was a big study. <laughs> it was a truly, I mean, it was a truly a landmark study. And uh, But it also promoted and I think encouraged the use of cannabidiol as an aug augmenting treatment for psychosis, didn't it? I think. I think Maguire down at King started using, you know, cannabidiol based on your work to see if he could, you could ameliorate psychotic symptoms. Yeah, in much higher doses. And he had some success with that. I think it, ultimately that didn't prove to be that fruitful. But yeah, I mean, Phil, Phil Maguire's work has done Paul Morrison. So there's a bit of inconsistency in the literature. And then Marcus Lueker over in Germany, he also had a study looking at giving CBD to people with psychosis and found, yeah, some reductions in symptoms. No, also the group at Yale, again, try that with chronic schizophrenia. And that's, I mean, again, that, that was a positive finding. So, but there are trials underway now, giving cannabidiol to people with prodromal symptoms of psychosis. So that's where these kind of in adolescence, to early adulthood, where people start getting unusual perceptual experiences. And of these people that exhibit this specific Kind of pattern of symptoms about a third of them will then transition onto schizophrenia so it's been quite controversial medicating those people because you don't you know they don't actually have a diagnosis and they're only a third of them are going to go and transition potentially to get it but i would kind of a dial because it's i don't want to say it's nerd it's like you have a very good safety profile and it doesn't seem to have any it's not inert and it's not seizures if you take enough of it we know that <laughs> yeah 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 there's that <laughs> 
But yeah, so that's it's now being used to potentially we've got yet to see the findings of that study, but it's certainly underway. So it'd be really interesting to see whether you can manage prodromal symptoms with cannabidiol. But yes, I mean it's interesting as well because it's become so popular now. And you know, when we first started looking at it, I, it wasn't available as a herbal supplement or um, you know in the way. It... Hello, drug science podcast listeners. I wanted to quickly tell you about an event we're hosting on the 9th and 10th of April, 2022. And this is the second Drug Science Student Psychedelic Conference. The last one was an enormous success, not least because, of course, it's the most inexpensive psychedelic conference in the world, with tickets as low as £5 for a two-day online conference. And during the conference, we're going to cover a whole range of different topics, music, philosophy, relationships, and much more. And you can find the tickets in the show notes for this episode and on the Drug Science website. And I look forward to meeting you all again at the conference. And now, back to the show. I mean, did anyone, of all these 600 people, how many how many of them have even heard of cannabidiol, do you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, at that time, no, I don't think, because it was back in, you know, over about 15 years ago. They're not very many. <laughs> yeah. People are really concerned about the THC content of cannabis, really, and that's the thing. I think subsequently studies by people like Tom Freeman have shown that's the content that users can pick up on. <laughs> yeah, we did seem to show, you know, there were some effects of cannabidiol, much less marked in that study, as is often the case when you follow up a promising early finding. <laughs> so, um, but we did, I mean, there was, like, to light, there was some effects on smoking, so we went on to follow that up, you know, and this is really Val's work, but looking at um, cannabidiol and people smoking cannabis to see if you might reduce some of the symptoms of cannabis dependence. And that those, that was a clinical trial that generated some positive findings. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the recent treatment trial, yeah. But explain to people why you had to go to their homes. Why couldn't you just bring them into the lab? Well, I mean, because they were smoking their own cannabis and we weren't allowed to let them bring their cannabis in to smoke. But we did have another... Oh, hang on. Was it smoking that was bad or was it the, the fact that... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's smoking or their own cannabis. Yeah. So, because we were allowed to give them actually cannabis in volcanoes, so these inhalators in the lab. So we um, brought them in, but that was that was a liquid form of CBD in alcohol that we bought and um, THC. So yeah. Yeah. Because we wanted to look at the naturalistic cannabis. So our idea was kind of looking, seeing naturally occurring cannabis in the wild. <laughs> Oh, the variation of cannabis oil, whether that's a kind of protective way that users have, or whether the kind of cannabis that's got higher levels of cannabis oil is more protective um, and less damaging, and if it's potential kind of harm reduction method. Yeah, you were fortunate because if you did that experiment now, you would, wouldn't be able to get anyone with cannabis oil, would you? So you, you were fortunate, you're on the cusp of the yeah. transition from the, the mixed mixtures to the, to the. And even then, yeah, when we looked at the data, it's pretty low levels overall. So we really? can only track the reductions in cannabidiol over time. I think that's why it was potentially less sensitive. Because I think you really have to target. There's a kind of pattern of older, more discerning cannabis user who will go for kind of hashish and those sorts of types of cannabis that have typically got high levels of CBD. Well, they may be, I mean, maybe that's changed now that people are more aware of it and people seek higher CBD strains of cannabis, I'm not... Well, they may seek, but they may not find. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's a, a terrible shame in a way. It is. Well, actually, yes. We, we, I don't want to go into policy. I, I, yeah, let's, let's, stick, let's stick to science in this particular podcast because uh, it's, it's more rewarding. Um, and so, so then you've, you've now flipped to using what I mean to treat addiction. This, this very addictive drug is now the salvation of people who are addicted. So how did you get that idea? I mean, I think, you know, it's been around for a while, that idea. And I do, like I said, you know, things are going to have both properties. And I don't think it's the drug inherently that's bad, you know, the reasons why people become addicted to things. And that was quite clear. Like, we, we've we worked with a lot of people who recreationally use ketamine or take it occasionally and experience no negative consequences of it. So I, for that subset of users particularly, it's damaging. But, you know, there's been this will work around for a while um, looking at well, ketamine psychedelic therapy was something that was written about by Evgeny Kropitsky, who's a, he's a Russian psychiatrist, and he'd been working throughout the 80s and 90s looking at giving really high doses of ketamine um, to inpatient alcoholics in St. Petersburg. And he'd 
through that work found some really dramatic reductions in relapse rates with this method. So he'd been giving them these high dose ketamine and then using psychodynamic psychotherapy alongside. I mean, to start with, he used a kind of counter conditioning approach. I think he was kind of wafting bottles of vodka under people's noses and using what was like essentially potentially a bit of aversion therapy combined with psychodynamic therapy. But yeah, he found reductions in relapse rates at one year. So in of in people who had been drinking in you know, really damaging levels of alcohol, reductions in relapse rates of around forty percent, which is absolutely huge and greater than any other, you know, treatment we have around alcohol now. And at the time it seems like a, a an unusual finding. But then with all the emergent research on ketamine and antidepressant and then through that research kind of endeavour. There's a lot more research about the neurobiology behind ketamine and making this plausible story why why these findings coming out. Hang on, before we get to the plausible story, let, we're really interested to know why he started. Do you know why he, why he even, what was the insight? I mean, that's, I, obviously in work that's pretty controversial, Salvador Roque had been using ketamine amongst other psychedelics, you know, and his work's been back in the Mexico. So I'm definitely out there in that psychedelic sphere as a potential drug of use. And then John Lilly, you know, the famous neuroscientist who that film Out of States is about, wrote an autobiography about his experiences on ketamine. I mean, which were, you know, he was arguably very addicted to ketamine. they have had a psychotic episode. I think he went to see the president to tell them that him that the world was being taken over by computers. But he also had some um, useful therapeutic insights. So I think in that sphere, or maybe that's why Jenny started that work. I mean, sadly for him, then Ketamin was banned altogether in Russia in 2003. So he just had to stop all that program of research. No, I didn't really. Yeah, because of the increasing recreational use. Yeah, although, and then it was banned for use in animals. In this weird story where then Bridget Bardot petitioned Putin, I think, <laughs> on behalf of the animals. And then the ban was reversed for animals, but not for humans, which is more. <laughs> No, okay, okay. So the, the Russian troops aren't going to be getting ketamine on the battlefield. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, maybe that'll help deter war. Let's fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. If Jenny went away and did this fascinating study, both, but he didn't just do alcoholics, did he? I think he did heroin addicts too. Yeah, he did opiates as well and found similarly quite um, dramatic reductions, particularly with a psychedelic dose. So he was giving really high doses, like two to three milligrams per kilogram, which is high. You know how much to make would render someone catatonic and have complete kind of ego death and so these very transcendent experiences so very different to the doses that are given in ketamine antidepressant treatment where it's kind of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram so you can see like yeah around six times higher than that but because he's definitely capitalizing on the psychedelic effects he did a study with a, a much lower dose compared to a psychedelic dose in heroin addicts and found that it was the psychedelic dose that was more effective which is kind of contrast to some of the recent work in depression, which suggests that, you know, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram is the best dose <laughs> and the higher doses aren't any more effective. I think maybe that's, that's research is not using ketamine in a psychotherapeutic context. So that's a real difference from Evgeny's work and the world of the depression work, really. Well, let's just talk a little bit more about your work. So, cause you've now pioneered the, uh, the use of ketamine for alcoholism, right? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've well, I was lucky to get the grant from the Medical Research Council, so in the UK state to run a trial, which was quite unique in, in that was one of the first trial to compare, to run an actual clinical trial, comparing the effects of ketamine with and without therapy, because most of the research, when I applied for that grant, and then I had two children while I was doing the grant, so it all got very delayed. <laughs> Um, but when I applied for it, there was only really research giving ketamine, apart from Evgeny's work, much earlier. I'm giving ketamine as a pharmacological agent on its own without giving it alongside therapy. And I thought, given the work in the psychedelic therapy field, that there was a potential to use ketamine in, in that way and that we kind of needed to run a trial of that. So that's what we did. Hang on, it's just, it's just called the CARE trial, right? K A. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just published in the American Journal of Psychology. Yeah, with a K. <laughs> yes, it's recently been published. But yeah, I thought, care, I thought care was a good acronym because it made ketamine sound a little bit more, you know, fluffy. <laughs> yeah. 
What does it stand for? Ketamine alcohol and alcohol. It was one of those acronyms, acronyms that doesn't work perfectly. Has a lot of clinical ones. <laughs> so ketamine for alcohol reduction of relapse. We had to be tested ninety six patients over six months in four groups. So we had ketamine with and without therapy, and placebo with and without therapy, and we found the most dramatic reductions in drinking. Wait, Celia, just tell us a bit more about the study. Uh, so it was three doses of ketamine, is that right? With or without psychotherapy? Oh, yeah. So the, the treatment procedure, actually, um, was, so we were giving three infusions of ketamine and it was 0.8 milligrams per kilogram, I mean, which is higher than had been used in the depression studies. And that's because there's some evidence that people who drink a lot are cross-tolerant to um, ketamine so because alcohol works on some similar receptors at, at some point, particularly at higher doses. So we hiked up the dose a bit, also in line, a bit more in line with Evgeny's work, or the, by no means the psychedelic levels of, of that bit of research. But yeah, then we also gave alongside that. So the study was funded by the Medical Research Council. We wanted to use an evidence-based therapy. Um, so we adapted something that's being used in addiction treatment, which is mindfulness-based relapse prevention, but adapted that for ketamine. And mindfulness-based therapy seemed like quite a good fit with ketamine because we can think of the kind of acute experience as a bit of a sort of experiential stepping stone to mindfulness. They can give people insights into that kind of practice. But we wanted to keep the protocol kind of as manageable as possible. So people had seven sessions of psychological therapy, which isn't a really large number. And they're an hour and a half long, so longer than normal sessions. But in the middle, they did some mindfulness or relaxation practice. And so what the way the sessions were, they would have a session of psychological therapy of an hour and a half, and then they'd come and have an infusion of ketamine. And then they'd recover from that, and they'd come back the next day and have another session of psychological therapy. And we timed that in that way. So the first session could be used kind of a bit to prepare people for the infusion experience. And they came back next day, partly because of some of the literature that's, you know, come out looking at the effects of ketamine at promoting neuroplasticity, so the growth of new synapses and neurons, and that seems to peak around 24 hours post-dose. So we thought if we had the psychological therapy session there, we could capitalize on this kind of capacity of the brain to be able to learn, you know, be plastic and learn new things, which is effectively what we ask people to do in psychological therapy. So, so they repeated that procedure. So an hour and a half kind of preparation and psychological therapy infusion, and then coming back the next day for three weeks. And then they had a final kind of session of psychological therapy. And then we followed people up at three and six months. Yeah, massive study. Yeah, I mean, that well, must have taken many years to do. Yeah. Yeah, and not having the children <laughs> in between, which they didn't help things. So, yeah, but I mean, I think in terms of the actual recruitment phase, it's about three years in total. So we used two sites. They went in London and one down here in Devon, where I am. Yeah, and then it's a great privilege to do that work, you know, it's working with patients and to be looking for new treatments in an area where, you know, we do need some new ones. <laughs> and you found pretty good, you know, a very a clear difference between the the ketamine plus mindfulness versus the non-ketamine plus education, wasn't it? Yeah, so in a way it was good. The results came out in the way we hypothesized for the number of days that people were abstinent from alcohol, where we saw the greatest reduction in people given ketamine in therapy, and then the group given ketamine without therapy, and then placebo in therapy, and then placebo without therapy. So that was great. I mean, it was a what's called a phase two trial. So that's just kind of finding proof of an effect. And now we're taking it on to the definitive trial. So where we show whether it's in a larger population across more sites. So we're rolling that out now, hopefully. And at the same time, working with the NHS, because really passionate that it's something that becomes widely available if it is effective. Um, but it's quite a different model of treatment to things that are out there at the moment, giving the therapy and the drug combined. So something I think is important work to do is explore how we might deliver that in more traditional healthcare settings in addiction treatment services as they are across the UK. So yeah, we're doing that work at the moment as well, working with our local NHS trust. Do you think, did you find that, you know, that generally the psychiatrists, psychologists were interested in this combined approach or do you find that there are some who sort of still feel that their own individual pathways are adequate and you don't need to cross the 
Yeah, I don't know. I think psychologists are more into it than psychiatrists. I'm not sure. No, but it depends on the psychiatrist, depends on the psychologist, I think. I think for psychologists, people acknowledge, particularly in addiction, maybe psychological therapies often don't work as well as they might, or some of them are effective. It's like using a drug to catalyze the therapy is a really good idea. But it's interesting. I mean, I get I get vilified quite a lot, even by psychiatrists for being a biological, you know, being a psychopharmacologist, but you, I mean, you're even more extreme. I mean, you know, you're a, a, psycholo- a psychologist who believes in drugs. I mean, do you find that, you know, or maybe maybe they're less critical of you. Maybe they think you're more responsible than me. But... I don't know. I think it's the, you know, yeah, so do you get vilified for being too biological? But you are psychological as well. <laughs> exactly. But, but there are people who think, well, no, I mean, you know, but I am, at least psychiatrists kind of, you know, we're always labelled, are oh, you prescribed drugs? Where a psychologist, you know, you you talk to people, and now here you're talking to people, but you're giving them drugs as well. I just I just wonder how the profession views you. you... Yeah, <laughs> I like to think we're all shifting towards something more, you know, like a different approach where we're combining everything that we're learning, taking the best from it all, really. And that's why I think all of these approaches, like psychedelic therapy, may be a kind of paradigm shift in the way we see the treatment. And we do need something more, and I do think, you know, both camps would acknowledge the failings of some of the work so far <laughs> so, mm, yes yeah <laughs> long may you be free from from opposition um, because because the other thing i want you to share with people if that's all right is that you have a vision which is that you can not just disrupt alcohol dependence addiction craving whatever but you can also disrupt other forms of addiction particularly behavior addictions can you share with us a little bit about your thoughts there yeah i mean i think because people do find this quite I don't know, challenging, I suppose, because behavioural addictions don't involve taking a drug and then the idea that you would take a drug to deal with behavioural addictions. But actually, when you see the problems and that they cause in people's lives, so we're working with gamblers at the moment, and I've definitely seen just how devastating gambling addiction can be, that we do need a new approach. And I think that, that you know, these drugs and therapy approach could potentially be something that's really useful in that area because we don't really have that many good treatments for that at the moment. I mean, we don't have any drugs approved for behavioural addictions and they're really difficult to crack because unlike, you know, substances that you can actually avoid them for the rest of your life, when you're talking about, you know, it's controversial to talk about food addiction, but you can't give up food. People are, we're working with people who are, you know, addicted to porn and have compulsive sexual behaviour and arguably you might not be able to give up sex. So. It's really about changing your relationship with the substance or the behavior. And that's what these, this new approach of combining ketamine and therapy seems quite good at doing. And we know that from interviews with patients and then also from studies looking at how giving ketamine can modulate memories associated with drug addiction. And so there's some interesting work like Ravi Das and Sanjeev Kambodja in my old lab have done some work looking at rewriting kind of maladaptive memories and so it's with social drinkers, but giving ketamine after reactivating a memory of alcohol can, the idea, I mean, this stems from literature on reconsolidation. So this is a process where in order to update your memories, when you reactivate them, they become destabilized. And if you give certain drugs, they can interfere with the restabilization process. So this effectively weakens memories. And there's some interesting evidence coming out of studies like Ravi's study, so they gave they reactivated alcohol memories and they gave ketamine and then found that actually, you know, even I think it was two months later, they showed reduced drinking. So that actually doing something very, very simple and giving um, ketamine in this way can actually we can potentially weaken memory. So that's something we're exploring right now in behavioral addiction with ketamine. So yeah, I'm excited to do that work and we do in that area. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. As you, you know, it is the utility of psychopharmacology is, is spreading and spreading. Yeah, well, good luck to you. And um, I mean, Exeter is an interesting place to be. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, you were presuming that I said, I think the beginning, the first professor of psychopharmacology there, you're in a psychology department, aren't you? Yeah, we may be moving more uh, kind of closer to the medical school. But yeah, I think it's good having psychopharmacology in a psychology department. <laughs> I mean, I'm following the footsteps of Val Curran, who I mentioned as my mentor. And <laughs> she was a psychology professor of psychopharmacology. <laughs> so, I think it's a good tradition to follow, but yeah. No, no, I'm fully signed up to that. It, it, what was it? It was interesting. I was thinking, um, 
you and I were both at Val's uh, le leaving due the other day, and uh, I have to say, it's it seems to me that psychologists, there's so many more psychologists who are doing psychopharmacology than psychiatrists, <laughs> which, uh, which is embarrassing. It means that obviously she's a better was a better teacher than I was, but uh, maybe just the students the students were more receptive. <laughs> Well, they're all the psychiatrists are turning to psychology. <laughs> That's the paradigm shift, right? <laughs> That's right. We're coming together. Yeah. But all I, I can say is I'm, I'll just share a few th thoughts. You know, I mean, you and I've started working with, you know, the audience may not may not know this, but uh, you do know that, that Celia and I have started working together to see if we can, uh, if I can add a little bit of uh, a little bit of extra to her um, her capacity to change the world through uh, through using drugs and uh, and psychotherapy together, and we're working trying to develop uh, expand our MDMA program in in terms of treating alcoholism, and hopefully I'm giving you a you know a little bit of guidance occasionally in terms of your your behavioural therapy program. So it's been a great pleasure the last six months working with you and helping you devise these these new developments. And uh, all I can say is that one thing's for sure, you're going you're gonna to achieve a lot more in the next 10 years than I am. So I'm right behind you there, Celia, and I, I really wish you well, as I'm sure, I'm sure all the listeners will. Well, it's been absolutely great talking to you. And uh, at some other point, you know, you'll have to tell the listeners how you cope with children as well as being a, a successful researcher, but perhaps not tonight, because you probably go, go and put them to bed. So thank you very much for joining me in this podcast. And uh, I look forward to talking to you professionally next week. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. Thanks a lot, Celia.